Hi, everybody. My name is Patrick Kolbeck. I'm a former two-term Michigan State Senator and a former candidate for governor of the state of Michigan. Uh, what I want to talk to you today about is something that uh, um, is a very important topic to a lot of us. On November 3rd, we're going to be casting our vote for not only who's the next president of the United States, who's our congressperson, who's our um, perhaps our next senator, um, our U.S. senator, um, and all the other elections and candidates down the ballot here. Um, but I would submit that something bigger is on the ballot this year, and there is a conscious effort at what I would characterize as sedition going on in America. And I've seen this on the frontier for, for years um, as a Michigan senator and did my best to identify it and uh, expose it and fight it. And, uh, but the stakes are getting really high, and uh, this election, it's, it's really high. A lot of people are um, uh, rightly concerned. There's people that are seeking and openly advocating for the fundamental transformation of America. We see this manifest in sedition, and this sedition takes many different forms all across the country. We've seen it in the riots characterized as protests that have happened in cities like Portland and Seattle and Minneapolis and Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, but, uh, you know, we've also seen it in the form of um, restricting people's free speech and um, denying their ability to express political views and worldviews that are counter to those espoused by those in power. We've seen that with big tech censorship. We've seen it for years um, when it comes to the legacy media, um, just by not just uh, about how they shape stories that are actually put out there, but by selecting what stories are put out there in the first place. And so it's really important that we understand the magnitude of what we're talking about here in this upcoming 2020 election. The people that are seeking to fundamentally transform America are relentless. They sought to overthrow our president and uh, via false Russian collusion charges. They went on to impeach him on hearsay evidence, even though we've got first-person evidence uh, against the current Democrat Party nominee in Joe Biden um, that, that highlights the level of corruption that's well beyond even what was alleged uh, for President Trump. So this is serious. They, and the reason why that's important to highlight that is that they will stop at nothing. And I've been thinking long and hard for quite a while about what is going on and how are they, um, how are the, those who seek to fundamentally transform America going to do that? And I'm going to outline what I believe they're working on and what they've implemented in regards to this 2020 election. A lot of the information I'm going to be sharing today is specific to um, information that I have about the elections here in Michigan. As everybody knows, Michigan is a swing state. It's a very important state in this upcoming election, particularly from a presidential perspective. And uh, But I, I would submit that a lot of the tactics uh, that are I'm going to be highlighting uh, around the state of Michigan apply across the country as something that people should be aware of. And so um, first and foremost, I want to highlight that the, the role that this COVID-19 outbreak is playing in context of enabling this fundamental transformation. Um, for those of you who don't know, in Michigan, uh, we've essentially been under a lockdown since uh, uh, Governor Whitmer uh, introduced uh, ex Executive Order 2020-21 uh, on uh, March 23rd. And uh, since that point in time, she's put on more egregious, more egregious, more egregious uh, um, emergency uh, executive orders under a uh, under a state of emergency. Michigan had a statute, the PA 302 of 1945, that allowed the governor to go off and issue a state of emergency, and which gave her some pretty broad, undefined powers. And essentially, she delegate uh, the legislature during the course of that state of emergency, essentially delegated under that 1945 law their authority. Um, to for to make laws and edicts uh, um, to the governor. Well, um, there was also a 1976 law that was put in place uh, to curb that authority, um, and it was called PA 390 of 1976. And what it did was limit the governor's authority to do that to just 28 days. And it could be extended beyond that, but in order to do so, you needed the support of the legislature to do that. In Michigan, that support did not extend, and and 
Um, for those of us who've read the actual law, it ended on April 30th. Well, it, uh, the governor ignored that and kept on issuing those orders, and it finally took a Supreme Court ruling, Michigan Supreme Court ruling, on October 2nd of this year uh, to rule in accordance with the rule of law in a unanimous decision that the state of emergency in Michigan was over. And that, uh, although the decision was rendered October 2nd, uh, the decision actually highlights how the state of emergency in Michigan was technically over on April 30th. Uh, now the governor went out and uh, decided to go off and pitch that this was a uh, partisan ruling. And mind you, this is a 7-0 ruling. Well, there were two decisions in that ruling. One was uh, regarding her authority to issue executive orders under a state of emergency. That was a unanimous 7-0 ruling. The other uh, ruling that was more along partisan lines of the 4-3 decision dealt with the constitutionality of the 1945 law in the first place and that was a split decision where uh, four of the justices did say that uh, the delegation of the legislative authority to the executive branch was unconstitutional on the face of it. So um, I want to make sure everybody understands that and just to show the degree to which uh, the uh, governor wanted to hold on to this emergency power, particularly through the elections, which I think this COVID, I'm going to try to make the case and highlight how COVID-19 policy is being used to go off and subvert the integrity of our, our elections this year. Um, she was working, doing everything she possibly could to extend her authority over arbitrary or her authority to issue arbitrary executive orders based upon COVID-19 uh, through the election cycle. And so as soon as that Supreme Court decision came out on October 2nd in the state of Michigan, that unanimous 7-0 Michigan Supreme Court decision, what did the governor do? She said, no, 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 I got 21 days or 20, and then later 28 days to go off and implement this ruling. That's not the way it works for Michigan Supreme Court rulings. They take effect immediately. And uh, there's another lawsuit, believe it or not, that had to go off and be filed to say, no, it takes effect immediately. But the damage was done because the media here in Michigan was going off and parroting that, oh, wait, the, the governor's got 21 more, I mean, 28 more days to go off and uh, implement uh, her emergent state of emergency. That wasn't the case. The, uh, the wording of the ruling was very clear. The precedents of rulings like that were very clear. They're effect effective immediately, but that didn't stop the governor from buying time so that she could go off and start issuing rules from the administrative state. And... That's what she went off and did. So right after the state of emergency was over, she decided to go off and use administrative agencies um, under her control to go off and extend that state of emergency and extend some of the arbitrary policies that she was promoting on, in context of that state of emergency. And what she was trying to do is use our public health code and a statement, a portion of the uh, public health code specifically that dealt with epidemics. So under a under an epidemic uh, condition, they are a limited set of authorities at the Department of Public Health, i.e. what's currently called the Department of Health and Human Services here in the state of Michigan. There's a limited set of authority for them to restrict the size of gathering, to restrict assembly, and, and actually put in force other rules regarded to the delivery of public health services. Um, that's under Michigan Compiled Law 333.2253. You can look it up for yourself at legislature.michigan.gov. So, she was essentially, when the Supreme Court decision came in, she was buying time to go off and issue additional edicts and rules and orders via the state agencies as a mechanism for extending um, the uncertainty, frankly, and uh, giving her an opening to go off and subvert different election process. And I'll talk about specific subversions uh, down the road here. But first thing I want to understand is that if there's no state of emergency, how is the governor still allowed to go off and issue a state of emergency based epidemic order? Well, she shouldn't be able to go off and do that, but she's been getting away with it. So how does that happen? Well, it happens when our legislature remains silent. Uh, if you actually go off and do a little bit of research, um, what you find is that the CDC, Center for Disease Control, um, actually defines what the uh, threshold is for uh, the official threshold or, uh, and definition around what an epidemic is. And it's when 7.5% of uh, the deaths, all of the deaths that occur at a given point in time are due to a specific 
outbreak or, or virus. Um, and in this case, uh, Michigan technically was no longer under an epidemic, uh, uh, in an epidemic state since June 1st of this year. Now, I talked about state of emergency being over on April 30th. Well, that was a technical of the legal definition. Now we're getting to the medical definition around an epidemic. If the governor was working with the state legislature and uh, was willing to go off and uh, um, jointly govern with them rather than serve as a dictator, uh, we could have extended that state of emergency for another few, for until the, um, uh, the uh, deaths due to COVID drop below epidemic levels. They didn't, she didn't do that. So now we're zeroing in on specifically the medical definition because now it's tying back to that public health code. And in that public health code, it says specifically under the conditions of an epidemic. Well, like I said, the conditions for an epidemic per the CDC, Center for Disease Control, which is where they punt to for all their guidelines um, in, at the state of Michigan, what they use as a basis now for all of their requirements um, around businesses, around schools. They always seem to point to CDC, but this is where they need to be pointing. And all the other states across the country need to have this under uh, in context as well. It's only an epidemic when 7.5% or more of the deaths are due to that outbreak. And uh, that's clearly not the case here in the state of Michigan. We've been below that threshold for quite some time. And thankfully, the death rate has been um, very, very uh, low ever since that initial outbreak um, back in the April time frame. So what happens next? So she can't make the case for an epidemic. She can't talk about the number of deaths that are happening. So what we've seen, not just in Michigan, but all across the country, is what has been termed a case-demic. So we've ended the epidemic, we've ended the pandemic, and now we're talking about something called the case-demic. So whenever we see an increase in cases, that immediately, it's just the number of cases now that justify an additional lockdown, or at least that's what they want you to go off and believe. Just because somebody has been identified as having uh, COVID-19 doesn't mean they're going to die from it. There is a big difference between the number of cases and the number of deaths. I would argue that the public policy should be driven based on the number of deaths, um, not the number of cases. And we need to speak out of, of, among that. Now, it's true. Number of cases could lead to, um, uh, as the number of cases increase, uh, you could increase the number of deaths, but that's not what's been observed. What we've seen here, and this curve demonstrates it very well, is that, like we were talking about before, the, the, uh, the number of deaths essentially has plateaued below the epidemic threshold back on June 1st. Um, since that time, uh, there's a lot more uh, going on here, and that, that uh, if you want to explain what the increase in the number of cases are, um, one of the best ways to explain it is via increase in testing. As you get more testing going on, um, then you're going to get an increased number of cases. And so this is actually something that government officials can manipulate. Uh, if you can go off and put people in situations where they have to take tests, particularly tests over and over and over again, so you can get the same person being tested more than once, and by the way, every time that they test positive, it's treated as another case. Um, when you go off and do that, you can actually dial up the number of cases that you have by dialing up the number of tests, and that's exactly what's happened. So if you look at the number of uh, 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 number of cases, a number of tests that we had back in April. Keep in mind that back in the state of Michigan, the only people who could get tested were those that were pretty much on death's bed, that were really um, outrageously symptomatic. They had fever, they couldn't had difficulty breathing, they couldn't smell. All the symptoms that were 100% indicative of having COVID. If you didn't have that, even when you went to the drive through testing area, you'd be, you'd be directed to just go home and sleep it off because um, people uh, would, uh, uh, they had limited testing supplies. Well, now I got a lot of testing supplies. So people are going out there and, uh, and, uh, and taking tests essentially as a condition to come back into the workplace, for example, or a condition to go back and play sports. And so there's a lot of repeat tests in particular that are being issued to the same people. And, uh, and what we see now, if you look at the data that came out in October, is that you know even though we've had 640 percent in more tests happening there's actually a drop in the number of cases and that's because um there's a lot less uh, um, uh, 
the, the virus has been out in the community. It's not as deadly as people had thought. It's not as prevalent as people had thought initially. And, uh, and you can argue that the April testing was done was kind of a biased selection, if you will, of the number of people that uh, could, uh, could be affected with the, with the disease. So, and now we're testing everybody as a condition of entry to workplace and some other things, uh, even as a condition of entry into hospitals, into getting, receiving healthcare for something not related to uh, COVID. That's one of the reasons why you see this, even though we've got a lot more testing going on, we're actually seeing a drop in the number of cases relative to, um, to those tests. So I think that's an important data point to keep in mind. So number one, understand that the number of deaths are well below epidemic level here in the state of Michigan. So when we talk about state of emergency being over, oh, it's over here in the state of Michigan. Uh, yet that's not keeping our government officials from continuing that and continuing to promote uh, the number of cases. So the number of deaths are down, so instead they're gonna go off and try to promote the number of cases. Why do they do that? Because they can control the number of cases that are specified by controlling the requirements around the number of tests that have to be issued. The more tests you get, the more cases you're gonna go off and discover, and that's what's happening right now. It is manipulated by government officials, and you need to understand that. And the end game of all this is to generate fear and keep people in fear so that they will uh, look the other way when the government goes off and issues non-constitutional, unconstitutional edicts, unlawful edicts like they have been in Michigan since day one. All right, so what are they doing? I believe this is all tied into the 2020 election. And when you look at the timeline of when uh, the Michigan Supreme Court issued its October 2nd ruling, um, which is more than a month out from the November 3rd election that said state of emergency is over. What did the governor do? Said, I want it 28 more days. That gets us pretty dang close to the election. Essentially, all the rules that are established to govern the election are firmly in place. All the poll workers have been trained, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then you just got essentially a, a, a handful of days after that 28 days were done so that they can just go off and execute the elections. Well, um, you can see how that works to the advantage of somebody who wants to use COVID as an excuse to go off and change how we've executed elections for years. Now, I'm not saying everything's been perfect for how we execute election over that time frame, but I'll tell you, you introduce a lot of chaos into the system when you start putting together a whole bunch of arbitrary rules related to COVID-19, and that's what they're counting on. And to date, they've implemented rules like uh, the six-foot distance rule, which is now getting challenged in the court right now. If you, uh, What they're doing on this is saying that poll challengers can't get within six feet of a poll worker who's actually executing the uh, election processes, which means essentially that a lot of folks, especially folks with bad eyesight like myself, are not going to be able to do a pretty good job of checking exactly what is happening when poll workers are doing simple tasks like verifying signatures against um, the ballots that they've received and against the, uh, the voters that have arrived at the polls. Or more to the point, what's going on with uh, absentee ballot uh, envelope signatures and verifying that against what's inside the uh, voter registration database. They're also doing some crazy little red herring uh, discussions around no carry rule. Uh, so they're, they're, even though there's no threat around, um, there's never been any issues associated with people doing open carry at the uh, polls. Um, what they decided to do, Secretary of State threw out some arbitrary rules saying, hey, you can't uh, uh, wear or you can't open carry a weapon within 100 feet of, uh, of polls or something uh, ludicrous like that. Essentially, using COVID-19, using the election and COVID-19 as an excuse to subvert the Second Amendment rights. Well, that's really good to go off and get all of us who are, are advocates of protecting our Second Amendment, Second Amendment rights all riled up, but it's a bit of a distraction. Um, it's a case of uh, look at the shiny object, which is important. We need to fight each and every one of these rules out there. But I'm going to submit in the next slide here, we're going to highlight what I think their real plan is and why we need to be concerned and, and vigilant in this election. Uh, the next thing that they're talking about going off and doing was uh, they're putting out these arbitrary rules on limiting the number of uh, people that can uh, assemble in a given building. And so what they're doing is providing limits of two or four poll challengers per building um, to oversee the elections. Uh, now, I'll tell you, the, the, uh, I know the Michigan GOP has put together about 1,200 
poll challengers uh, for this election. The organization that I helped start called the Election Integrity Fund has um, pulled together over 500 uh, independent observers to go off and serve as poll challengers. Um, so there's a lot of folks out there and what they're doing right now is using COVID as an excuse to keep these people from overseeing the integrity of the election. That's dangerous and uh, we're on to them. So we can't let this happen. And But I would submit all this is a distraction from the end game. Uh, the, what is the end game? Well, let's take a look. I think the main event that we're talking about here goes much deeper than some of these red herrings that are being thrown out at the, at the 11th hour here in the state of Michigan. Um, keep in mind, all those other ones are all associated with lawsuits. Whenever you do lawsuits, there's a Coward Piven strategy that says flood the zone. And if you're going off and chasing a whole bunch of shiny objects, you don't uh, take care of what's really important. Well, here's what I think is really important. First of all, we need to, um, and uh, I think the plan around this uh, was uh, formulated well before uh, this 2020 election. I think it was done before the 2018 election, leading into the 2018 election. It came out of the aftershock of the 2016 election. And, uh, and what happened was there was a national effort to push for ballot proposals in various states. And in Michigan, there was something called Proposal 3 that enabled no reason absentee voting and it also enabled ballot harvesting and also same day voter registration. All very chaotic elements to introduce and guess what, 2020 is the first time where all those changes that were pursued in the 2018 election are now going to take effect. So um, what did this enable? A whole bunch of crazy things. Uh, some things it didn't enable that are happening anyway though, I want to highlight the first thing though and that is the idea of third-party data entry. Here in Michigan, the Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, has partnered with uh, an organization called Rock the Vote. Rock the Vote is uh, famous back in the MTV days of uh, pursuing young voters and get them to come out and register to vote and get out there. It's, it's highlighted as a very, it's a push to get out Democratic voters. So Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, who is a Democrat, herself, a Democrat Secretary of State, has partnered with a Democrat organization. I, technically, they're independent, but they, they focus in on registering Democrat voters. Had they, she has given them access to Michigan's voter registration file. And it means uh, it's for Michigan, it's called Qualified Voter File. They're given access to go off and do data entry and add in voters to the system. So this whole voter registration uh, uh, file. That's our, our list of people who are eligible to vote in the upcoming election. And uh, in case of Democratic voters, that's dead or alive the way they usually operate. I hate to say that. I don't want to be disparaging. And believe me, I can, as somebody who's uh, uh, been in the Michigan Senate for eight years, I'm not saying Republicans are all saints either. And I can get into that's a whole different tangent to go into. But I can tell you where I'm seeing the corruption of this election process right now is happening via the Democratic Party. And Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson is leading the, the uh, cause on this. Um, and when you open up uh, the integrity of our voting system to a third party without checks and balances put in there, particularly checks and balances that ensure that uh, we've got um, both parties represented into, uh, into looking into the integrity of the data that's being in, in, entered in there, um, you've got a recipe for, for fraud. Um, now, when you couple that to other edicts that the uh, Secretary of State put forward, which is enabling online voter registration, which essentially eliminates our primary mechanism for validating the identity of absentee voters, which is by signature. When you're doing it online, you can't sign anything, right? It's, you got a big X there. They say that they've got alternative verification mechanisms. Well, they're not put into the ballot envelopes. That's not put into the ballot. So when you're actually checking on election day against the integrity of the voter and uh, or, or the integrity of who that voter is, and you're trying to verify that the person submitting that ballot is a person who is actually registered to vote, that's problematical. And and keep in mind, who is actually registered to vote was put, put in there by a third party uh, entity like Rock to Vote. That's a recipe for fraud. Next, you go down the line. You go into identifying the fact that not only did the Secretary of State allow for a third party to enter data into our qualified voter system, she actually used the data in the qualified voter uh, file to go off and mail people uh, 
applications to uh, for absentee ballots. That's 180 degrees opposite of the way it usually operates. Usually, people say, I want to vote absentee this time. They go reach out to the clerk's office and say, and apply for an absentee ballot. Um, and what's the difference? Well, I'll tell you. Here's the biggest difference. 20%, uh, you know, I work a lot with Catherine Engelbrecht out of True the Vote, and they've gone off and done some analysis, and, and on average, around 20% of the data in each state's voter registration file is outdated and, um, and invalid. And so essentially, you've got 20% of the data in that voter registration database that is fraudulent, that if those people tried to vote in that state, um, it would actually be committing an act of fraud. Well, our Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, enabled fraud for 20% of the voters by pushing out those ballots. Now, I've got a lot of people that have received multiple ballots coming out to these. A lot of, uh, a lot of times they've received multiple ballots to the same address for people that had not lived there for decades. Decades. Very interesting how they went off and get that information. Um, there's some collusion going on here that uh, with these third parties and everything else that's, that's not being highlighted. And just a little quick little aside, a, a friend of mine just talking to me yesterday and uh, she had a friend uh, that had uh, um, just recently gotten out of jail. And so she didn't have a driver's license, so she went to Secretary of State to go off and get a driver's license. When she's uh, registering to get her driver's license, she was uh, told that she needed to provide a phone number. So she provided a phone number. She got a brand new phone. It's the first time she ever presented that phone number to anybody and the only time she ever put it out to any third party at all. And uh, the next thing you know, is not, not long after she had actually submitted that phone, phone number to the Secretary of State, she got a call from uh, the Joe Biden for President campaign asking her to vote for Joe Biden. How did they get that phone number? Unless there was collusion between the Secretary of State and the Democratic Party. All right. So I've got some concerns on this upstream here, and this is why I believe this is important to go off and discuss. Next, we've got a, another third party involved, and this time it's some company that you may have heard of called Facebook. Uh, a, uh, Mark Zuckerberg provided $250 million to a pretty much unheard of organization before this election cycle to, a, or, to an organization called Center for Tech, Tech and Civic Life. Now, prior to the selection cycle, they never had more than seven hundred or nine hundred thousand dollars in their bank balance. But all of a sudden, thanks to Mark Zuckerberg's generosity, they got two hundred fifty million dollars. And what they like to do is put ballot boxes out in Democratic areas, primarily Democratic areas. You see a pattern: Rock the Vote pushing for Democrat registration. Now, ballot boxes being pushed in Democratic areas where they can they can essentially solicit for grants to go off and put ballot boxes out there. And a lot of these ballot boxes aren't locked down. Um, you can throw them. It's, it's, they're not monitored 24-7. Um, there's a lot of concern with how these ballot boxes are distributed um, throughout the state and throughout, uh, throughout the country, frankly, for that matter. So you've got a case where you've got one group going off and playing with the voter registration file. Um, so, and you've got other groups that are just pushing to get more and more uh, opportunities to go off and stuff ballots into the system, into the election system. And, and so take those two things here. We've got a whole bunch of ballots that uh, could potentially be pushed into the system without any oversight. And I can get into a whole bunch of stories about where people have been witness to drop off boxes of what appear to be ballots at uh, locations like the Detroit Elections Bureau. And as soon as you start filming them uh, or recording what they're doing, they um, throw all the boxes into the car and speed off. I I've got concerns around uh, the fact that we appear to be collecting a lot of ballots that, uh, uh, from an absentee ballot perspective, um, that uh, are going to have to be counted. And you, the first step, when all those absentee ballots reach uh, places like the Detroit Elections Bureau, um, the first thing you want to go off and do is validate the identity of the person who submitted that absentee ballot. And it starts out in a ballot envelope. And on the outside of that ballot envelope is supposed to be a signature. When that signature is in there, it's supposed to be verified against the voter registration uh, database. All right, so uh, first of all, let's assume that there's no chicanery with the data that was entered into that voter registration database. You've got to be able to match that signature to the, to the um, identification of a registered voter in that particular precinct. Um, and if you don't 
aren't able to match the signature on that ballot envelope with the signature in the voter registration file, then they're not eligible to vote or not supposed to be eligible to vote. All right. So that's kind of a big deal. Um, so now you understand why it's important that this whole online voter registration, why that could subvert the process, right? Because if you can't go off and verify signatures, how are you going to go off and do that verification? And our poll workers um, trained to go off and do any of this uh, additional verification activities that they claim under that uh, issuance of that rule. So we're running into an issue here about how do you identify um, the identity of the person submitting the ballot um, based upon data that's in the voter registration database. That's a big concern. And what's really concerning is that latest communications we've had with the Detroit Elections Bureau indicates that they are prohibiting, of course, under the guise of COVID, remember all those arbitrary rules that are being put out there based on COVID, because of COVID, we're not allowed to go off and, number one, validate the uh, integrity of their ballot envelope scanning machines, which apparently now they're not even using. They're called uh, reliable machines. They were not very reliable. Um, they had eight-point signature uh, uh, eight point signature verification technology, which is like decades old. Now they use rasterized images to verify the integrity of somebody's signature. That's what banks use when you submit a check online or over your smartphone. That's what they use. We don't use that for the most important aspect of, of uh, citizen engagement, which is voting. We don't even use that. And so they've said that they're adopting some other mechanism now. That's the latest hot off the press. But the, the issue with all of that is that they haven't told us what it is. They haven't told Republicans, they haven't told independent um, fact checkers and observers what that process is, and they have not identified how they're going to secure the chain of custody for the ballots that were submitted to the ballots that were um, uh, uh, where they validated the voter ID and where they've gone off and validated or all the approved ballots. They haven't told us how they're going to maintain the custody or chain of custody when they take that those ballots that have been approved over to the tabulation machines, which in the case of Detroit are in a completely different building called uh, Cobo Hall. So um, we've got a lot of concerns. And this is potential for hundreds of thousands of fraud, fraudulent ba ballots being inserted in the system and uh, uh, and then sent over to the tabulation machine. If, if the ballots make their way out of the... Uh, absentee uh, ballot uh, holding facility and they go over to the tabulation machines, um, there's no way of going back in time and checking the validity of that uh, voter identity. We've already lost our opportunity. So you, there's a firewall there. It's for, for You have to identify the, uh, you have to validate the identity of the absentee voter before you send it over into the tabulation machines. And uh, what we've seen as, you know, as recently as the August 4th primary election is that um, at 2 o'clock in the morning, um, people were, were told to uh, rip out the uh, ballots out of the ballot envelope prior to verification and just send them through the ta tabulation machine. Uh, that happens in this general election. And uh, what happened in 2016 is that Donald Trump won by a 10,747 vote margin, I believe it was. Um, there's an opportunity for hundreds of thousands of fraudulent votes being pushed through the system here if we don't check that identity up front. And, and like I said, I'm even concerned up front, even with the idea of these third parties going off and entering in um, potentially fraudulent uh, voter registration information. So, and, and when you cap it all off with the fact that they're deliberately stonewalling access and uh, to information around these processes right now and using COVID as an excuse, you understand why I'm so concerned about how they're deceiving people and deceiving people with the messaging around COVID and they're acting in an unlawful manner around COVID because it gives them cover for subverting this basic, this fundamental election process. So I'm just going to kind of summarize things up here. Uh, when you have third party voter registration data entry, you've got hundreds of thousands of votes that are going to be um, absentee ballots. Abs um, Yes, most of them are, the vast majority of them may be perfectly valid, but there's a high risk of invalid ones because of that third party uh, voter registration and some of the chicanery we've seen operating around some of the election offices to date. And then when you couple that with the fact that um, 
the folks who are responsible for, for monitoring that firewall, poll challengers, are being expressly denied from information about the process um, of doing this voter identification. Mind you, this is a brand new way that they're doing it this year, thanks to Secretary of State uh, Benson. Um, that's a concern. And uh, when we're being excluded from the ability to go off and monitor that process, that's an even bigger concern. And who actually does have access to it? Um, we need to be asking some fundamental questions right now. And, uh, and they need to be erring on the side of transparency. If we want these elections to go through in a fair and uh, free way, we need to be providing access to everybody in a fair and free way. And that's not what's happening right now in this election and why I'm very concerned about what is happening and why I've been very concerned about getting the truth out about what's going on with COVID because COVID is being used as a cover for subverting our election processes. And that can't stand, folks. Not only is that harming people's lives and, and uh, some of the policies coming out of the governor has actually cost more lives than saved. Um, and not only is it costing us our economy, as many businesses are told they're essential or non-essential or shut down altogether and, uh, or have significant expenses associated with operating because of all these arbitrary um, edicts that are being issued by the governor and her administrative agencies. Um, but uh, the, the, uh, the, perhaps the uh, biggest uh, casualty of this um, COVID uh, case-demic, if you will, uh, is our election itself and our system of government itself. So the folks who are seeking that fundamental transformation of America, you know, this is how they're doing it. They're seeking to undermine our elections and COVID is just a mechanism for them to go off and do that. So sorry, a lot to unpack on this stuff here. Um, hopefully a lot of information you can go off and independently verify. Um, I'm going to do my best to make sure that this gets out into the news cycle. But uh, a lot of news agencies are reticent to cover this. They don't want to, they're, they're continuing to push the governor's narrative to the exclusion of any uh, counter inquiries and counter data. And that's concerning. That's why I uh, kicked off a campaign uh, called puremichiganfacts.com where we're doing a billboard campaign to highlight uh, all the um, uh, all the truths about our current situation here in the state of Michigan, such as as we started this talk out on, such as stating that the state of emergency in Michigan is over. Matter of fact, it's been over since April 30th. The governor is the only one who doesn't realize that. And everybody that's listening exclusively to the governor are the only ones that don't listen, or that aren't aware of that. Guys, Michigan is open. We need to res resume a fair and free election process. We need to go back to our tried and true election processes, execute them, knock off all this COVID-based um, exceptions to the rule here and focus on making sure that we ensure that one person gets one vote and that only those who are eligible to vote are actually going to have their votes counted. I thank you very much for your attention. God bless you and please pray for our nation. This is going to be a um, very difficult election.